Bowers and Wilkins Nautilus speaker is maybe the most iconic speakers in the world. Bowers and Wilkins still produce them after many, many years. These nail-shaped speakers have been shown in museums, but for Lawrence Dickey, the design was based on sound quality. When it was launched 30 years ago, the reactions were mixed. It divided reaction, uh, and indeed everything I've done seems to d divide opinion, but uh, fortunately when we first unveiled the Nautilus we had an incredibly receptive bunch of Italian press who were ecstatic about it and it annulled any fears that some of the uh, ad administrative staff at BMW might have had and from that point they knew, let's go. <laughs> What's so special about the speaker? Well, the work that led to the Nautilus really convinced me that the important thing about um, the a fine loudspeaker was to minimize resonances and reflections and it's been my my motto my mantra if you wish uh, nautilus was the first manifestation of that in a completed product and i believe it still holds to this day and they are still producing it i've been visiting uh, barris and wilkins and they were really proud of it handmade uh, how is it uh, that they're still making it <laughs> I mean, I, I genuinely still believe that um, those qualities are unchanged. We, we achieved what we set out. We got those problems out of the audio band and they're still out there. <laughs> <laughs> but you have gone to Vivid. Uh, why did you uh, do that? Right, well, quite simply, the Nautilus, whilst being a very pure sound, and in that sense it really achieved what we set out to, it was very much a hi-fi loudspeaker and really a little delicate. And I wanted to take that sort of technology and apply it to a professional studio monitor. Now at the time, uh, BMW's only connection with the pro audio field was to supply 800 series to uh, EMI, Decca. But I wanted to get into the, you know, the sort of uh, rock studios, electronic music studios. So I left BMW and had uh, a couple of years in the wilderness where I just worked on perfecting um, a range of drivers which had um, much higher efficiency and higher power handling. Now, you made some extreme PA monitors. Ah, now, that's a, that I, my life at that point took two parallel tracks. So I indeed was given uh, a consultancy job at a company called Turbo Sound, a UK producer of high power sound reinforcement products. At almost the same time, um, a couple of guys in South Africa contacted me, Philip Guttentag and uh, Bruce Gessner, and they were interested in starting a loudspeaker company. And I went to visit these guys in Durban, and we just got on, and that was the birth of Vivid Audio. This is the last one. Uh, tell a little bit about it. Okay, so this indeed is the, our latest uh, little baby, the S12. Um, it's a stand mount S, and it's about 12 litres internal volume. Um, now, the interesting thing about this particular product is that whilst you can't see it, it has within it uh, an array of exponential absorber horns. That has been the feature of all Vivid products is the use of exponential horns, a little bit like the Nautilus, to absorb uh, parasitic resonances and reflections. This little creation here is actually a prototype that we used just to prove the principle that uh, a, a volume with an array of exponential absorbers still maintains a low frequency the low frequency fundamental resonance which is important for a bass reflex so if I just blow across it in the way that you would blow across a bottle you can hear that it resonates but with a purity there are no overtones no resonances these tubes are inside the S12 uh, effectively laid down inside the exterior shell. In fact, there are two shells. There's the exterior shell that you can see, and then there's an inner shell, and between them are a number of partitions. So the exponential horns are formed between those partitions, and the behavior is, like, is just like this. And the result is a complete elimination of resonance. But of course, people are asking, is it possible to play bass with these small <laughs> guys? <laughs> well. It wouldn't be, <laughs> I wouldn't be happy with a loudspeaker that wasn't 
capable of producing some bottom end. And for me, really the bottom end, the bottom E of a bass guitar should be a minimum requirement. So I've tuned the port on this little baby to 40 hertz, so yes, it can reproduce bass. And we've also um, created a very long throw bass driver here. It may only be a 100 millimeter cone, but it can move 25 millimeters uh, with, with the coil in the gap, so it's got a really excellent long throw. There are uh, another series of speakers called Gaia. Can you tell a little yeah. bit about uh, these speakers? Indeed. So the B1 and K1, which were our first products, whilst they had the exponential absorbers on the mid and the high frequency drivers, the base chamber itself was a fairly acoustically ordinary uh, situation. So uh, whilst it was a funny elliptical shape, it was acoustically just the chamber with a port. When it came to designing gear, I felt that it was high time I found a way of combining the benefits of the absorber with the port. So after doing some experiments and some uh, computer-aided modeling, I came up with uh, a, a rule of thumb that if you had the um, cut-off frequency of the exponential horn four or five times the port tuning, you could actually get the best of both worlds, the absorption of the resonances and the port output. Now, I've actually brought with me uh, a little demonstration experiment. So this is really representing an ordinary bass reflex loudspeaker, and I'll blow into it. You can hear the fundamental resonance, that hmm. But if you listen carefully, you can hear some higher notes. And if I blow hard, you'll hear that those notes start to resonate. So what's happening there is that the um, eigentones of this uh, volume are being excited by the air rushing across that lip. Now, what I'll do is to add this exponential absorber, and you'll hear that the fundamental is still there. But already, the overtones have gone, and if I blow harder, there's just that increase in rushing sound, and the envelope of the sound goes up, but it doesn't excite the resonances anymore. So that was the principle that was used in gear, and in fact, if I arrange it like that, that is more or less what's going on. You've got the, the chamber, the port, and this exponential absorber at the top, but of course in gear, we curled it round to make the thing smaller. It seems fairly difficult to make. It is a little bit labor intensive, I won't deny it, yes. <laughs> How do you make it? We use a vacuum infused uh, composite, so we have single-sided tooling, so we, we uh, lay up the three layers, the first layer of uh, quadraxial glass, the core material, which in the top of the range gears is end grain balsa, uh, and then another layer of glass, and then we put the whole lot in a vacuum bag, apply a vacuum, and then when the whole lot is completely um, evacuated, we allow the resin to flood in and fill the spaces. Then we leave it to cure, which is maybe two or three hours, and then remove the bag and pop the shell out of the mold. Now, each speaker, of course, requires two half shells, which are then bonded together with an array of grids, which once upon a time I would have called a matrix, <laughs> to reinforce the structure from a, uh, in a lateral dimension. So it's quite complicated. It is quite complicated, yes. What is next for uh, Vivid? Well, we've done the very smallest. I think it's about time we did something really big. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger than the biggest? Look, it, it's just, I, I would like to. I, I might have a few arguments with my business partners, but I think we should do something properly big. <laughs> do you want to see more videos like this? Please subscribe and press the like button.